misnomer. Um, the ship they went on was the Aurora, which had been with Mawson. And what happened there was that they went, to get rid of that map, but I didn't. Um, they went to Ross Island with the ship, set up depots there, and left them there for Shackleton and his men to come and pick up when they crossed Antarctic, which of course they never did. They did a fantastic job. Everything in Orozco, and depots every 60 nautical miles, every degree, with dogs. Um, when they left Hobart, they were seen off by Lady McCartney, who happened to be Captain Scott's sister. Anyway, they laid the depots. The leader of this expedition was Macintosh, the depots they laid, who had lost his eye in the Nimrod, you might remember. He also had a clergyman with him, Spencer Smith. And on the return journey, he became weaker and had actually died. Not a distinction of being the first clergyman to die in Antarctica, but he was two days from getting back uh, to Hut Point and safety. And here he is, he used to have a communion, I think, in one of Scott's old huts. Uh, this is um, a group calling um, Macintosh. In fact, Frank Wilde's brother, Ernest Wilde, called uh, um, Spencer Smith 300 miles as he was slowly, slowly dying. Their sledge journey back to the and this is the leader, the captain, who had um, moderate skills as a, a leader. Uh, this is Macintosh. When he got back to Hut Point, along with the rest of the party, minus so there were nine of them now, Macintosh and a fellow called Hayward had an idea they go north across the ice, 30 miles or so, to Cape Evans, Scott's other hut because they knew there were supplies and goodies there. And they set off one morning, and one of the other fellows on the trip said, you may call the old cautious, but I wouldn't go to Cape Evans today for all the tea in China. This is the 8th of May, and they were never seen again. In fact, three people lost their lives in that part of the expedition. What about the ship? That was the Aurora was meant to be uh, waiting there for them. It was going to overwinter in the ice. The previous year, it got blown off the ice, out to sea, and spent over a year trapped in ice, rudder smashed up, and having been blown away on the 6th of May, 1915, didn't get to New Zealand till the 3rd of April the following year. And there were a number of times where the captain, John Stenhouse, got them to prepare to abandon ship. So that could have been another part of a, 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 a ferocious disaster. One, so this is what happened to them. They had been at this hut and they were just blown all the way. This is the edge of the Antarctic continent. And, um, and they were blown away. They're, they had big cables and hoisted up to the shore. There was a huge storm. Off they went, completely out of control. They had to make a new rudder. The old rudder was taken off. I think it weighed about four and a half tons. And how they got back to New Zealand is a miracle. Another part of that great story. Repairs in New Zealand. And this is then on January 1917. John King Davis said, I'll come and get them on the Aurora. And he said, Shackleton, you can come, but you're not going to be in charge at all. And here, in fact, are six of the seven survivors. And here's Shackleton <coughs> at one of the huts. And they did go and look for the bodies of Mackintosh and Hayward. Without success, here they are getting back into um, New Zealand. And this is one of the dogs, I think it was Oscar, who was a wonderful companion on their sledging journeys. The seven survivors, plus Shackleton, plus John King Davis. And here's just another photograph. I just want to point out this character here, because um, Hadley mentioned him, Cope, who was a uh, rather uh, a useless character later on on the um, Bagshaw, um, Western Bagshaw expedition. Shackleton got lots of medals then. He went off to Russia. 
to um, help in the war effort. Um, he was dressed up, as he said, I'm a sailor, really, I'm only dressed up like a soldier. He invented some boots, he went up to the Arctic to give him advice about polar conditions, um, and someone wrote a ditty about him. But always remember, from January to December, your shackles and boots you can praise, for they have taught you to stumble and skid, to skid and to tumble in 365 different ways. Anyway, he came back to, to Britain, uh, very broke, he would have loved credit cards, and lectured twice a day, six days a week, for five months in the Philharmonic Hall in London, trying to get them. One of the uh, people who backed the expedition was killed in the war, and the executors called in the cash. Um, so what was he going to do next? And um, he said to a friend, it's a strain, and all my life is a strain. I would not have it otherwise. I shall keep on going until I don't come back. What was in mind, his last expedition, the quest, it left London, Port of London, September 1921, a Norwegian sealer. And one of the last people to say goodbye to him was his ex-mistress, Rosalind Chetwin, and also his wife, yes, well, she did appear. And here is his last goodbye, I quite like this photograph of him, um, all dressed up for civilization, um, cap out looking for a few more pence. <laughs> And this is his la the last known photograph of him and his family, his long-suffering wife Emily, and Cecily just beginning to smile, Raymond, his eldest son, and Eddie, the younger son. They brought an aircraft, which was made by A.B. Rowe, and the designer was someone called Roy Chadwick, which, who went on to uh, uh, design the Lancaster bomber in the Second World War, and also an aircraft called Shackleton. Wilkins came too, who was famous later for doing the first flight in Antarctica from you know where, you were yesterday, Deception Island, uh, Wilkins was a remarkable man, and later when he died, his ashes were scattered at the South Pole in 1959. Uh, quite a few of his pals came with him. This was meant to be a trip to the Arctic, and actually the government support collapsed from Canada, so they went south again. And here is Macklin with the glasses and Hussey with the banjo. And of course, Charlie Green had hoped to be cooked both, both the Arctic Circle and Antarctic, but uh, he had to go back down south again, Charlie Green. Uh, this is a, probably the last photograph of Shackleton on land in Rio de Janeiro, November 1921, where he probably had a heart attack. And here is the last photograph of him and his old friend Frank Wilde. <coughs> Frank Wilde here, who'd been with him on the Nimrod and been with him on the Endurance. Frank Wilde's ashes were found recently in a, underneath a, a, a crematorium in Joburg, and they are now have been restored to be beside the fellow who was his, well, they were right, they were real pals, right-hand man, uh, Shackleton. Uh, sorry, these were White Wilde's medals, which were um, sold recently for a huge amount of money, which Wilde would have loved had he been still alive. Uh, so they came back into Ripviken on the 4th of January, 1921, 22, and wrote in his diary, another beautiful day, fortune seems to attend us, this is Shackleton. And the evening of the 4th of January, another beautiful day, this is his actual diary, Scott Polar, and written there is, in the darkening twilight, I saw a lone star of a gem light above the bay. Poetic words, his last words, and he died of a heart attack at 3 a.m. the next morning. Uh, they brought his body to Rio de Janeiro. He got a state funeral there, and then it was decided he should turn around. His wife decided it would be better if he was buried in South Georgia. So his body was brought back the 5th of March in a blizzard, and uh, the quest, the ship went on, and got beset in the ice. They landed, I think, at Elephant Island, but not at Point Wild. His men came back and uh, in April, um, on their return journey, but uh, the whole soul had gone out of the expedition. A headstone was raised in his grave in 1928, and on the back of it is written words from Browning, his one of his favorite poets, I hold that man should strive to the uttermost for life set prize, which actually is not what Browning wrote, but he chuckled and always thought so he'd improve it, and I won't read you Browning's actual words, but anyway, it wasn't too different, but typical of Shackleton. So it's a nice place to be buried amongst the Norwegian whalers, but his uh, headstone is uh, facing south, Scotch granite. 
and beside him now, on his left-hand side, but his right-hand side man, without a hyphen, is the ashes of Frank Wilde, which were brought from Joburg by a lady called Angie Butler, who had a wonderful detective story finding them. I was first there when I was the same age as Shackleton when he died, 47, and with me was Frank Hurley's two daughters. Both identical, they tease you with the names, which is which. They both lived to at least 90, one died, I think, about a year ago, Adele and Tony, both very accomplished, individualistic women. Tom Crean went back to Ireland and opened a pub in Anniskol, um, and unfortunately died quite young from a burst appendix, but the pub still goes on. Uh, there's a nice um, bronze statue outside of him holding the puppies on the endurance trip. His two daughters, one still alive, and they lived in houses in Tralee, County Kerry, named after Scots boats rather than Shackleton's endurance, which is probably sensible. Uh, Tom Creed built his own family grave in Bandercourty behind there, and this is his a wreath of flowers, which have been there since his death in 1938, left by Evans, whose life he saved on Scott's Terranova journey. Various publicity things for Tom Crean and the beer. Uh, McNeish, the grumpy Scotsman, ended up a down and out in, in New Zealand, and his grave was unmarked until fairly recently in the Karora Cemetery outside Wellington, New Zealand, and it's been beautifully restored, and the real centerpiece is Mrs. Chippy. A lovely um, tribute to McNeish, who was, didn't get the Order Medal either. Also nearby is Thomas Owen Reeves, who uh, became a spy in the war, did parachute jumping and uh, checkered life, and is also buried nearby. The quest uh, sank eventually on Svalbard, and it took part in Arctic uh, journeys, uh, one particularly in the search for Nobile, who disappeared uh, in the Arctic, and of course Amundsen went to look for him, and he disappeared, and nobody was found. Reunion in 1964, um, and the two doctors, uh, Macklin and McElroy, um, I talked to Macklin's widow later about this, and apparently the two doctors said nothing to each other, didn't talk to each other. So it's strange, you know, all they wanted to preserve the memory of the time. He had Charlie Green, the cook, he lived to one of the eldest, I think he was in 1970, he died. Macklin's grave, and just to finish up at Shackleton, uh, he's commemorated in many different ways. I think there are 11 different streets named for him, etc., etc. Um, this is a statue in the walls of the Royal Geographic Society in London, but it's um, A, two things. One is larger than life, and B, it's outside the committee rooms. It's on the street. You would have hated to be inside. Uh, other things named for him, um, this aircraft, which when someone first saw it said, is that an airplane or is it the box that came in? <laughs> And other people who flew it said it was like flying 50,000 loose rivets in close formation. <laughs> Very noisy aircraft, reconnaissance aircraft, which I think has spent a long time. And only recently, there might be still one uh, flown in South Africa, but there was an elderly crew and hard to replace. Shackleton's birthplace now still is there, um, where he was born in um, 1874. Uh, very nice couple live there now. Uh, several members of the family came back. This is Kathleen's sister. And this is Eleanor, the last one of the family to visit, uh, of his sisters, 1958. She lived that part of her life on Vancouver Island. The younger son, Eddie, was a prominent politician, and uh, he was a bright spark. He was made a Labour peer um, for his services. Uh, had a great twinkle in his eye, got great uh, many women friends. Um, uh, and our family flag, which he was given because he became a knight of the Garter, is hanging in the cathedral in Stanley in the Falklands. Of uh, anything you want to, you want to follow up Shackleton, there's probably one of the best Shackleton gatherings in the world, and Asai County go there uh, every October bank holiday weekend. This year we had Jason Anthony wrote that book Hoosh, uh, we had Klaus Dodd, and always we have this character here, some of you know, called Bob Headland, who's an expert on, um, he's an expert on um, anything polar, history, and also pods. <laughs> Alexander Shackleton, uh, Ernest Shackleton's closest living relation, uh, apart from his niece, um, is, she is um, a granddaughter. Former governor of the um, Falklands, David Tatham, who is, in fact, one of many Irish people with connections with the remote places. So to end, I'm going back home next week, and this is where I'll go, into the woods here, in County Cavan, Muller County Cavan. 
Uh, and what I'll see when I go up the avenue is hopefully all these crocuses. We have an organic farm, um, so we don't put on fertilizers, herbicides. That's my bedroom there. <laughs> Windows open. I always like the window open. I, I would love to open portholes, but I can't. Uh, organic farm, lots of wildflowers, and mainly Angus calves, which we fatten, that we breed ourselves. And curious enough, I got an email this morning to say we'd had twin calves yesterday, and there's the bull waiting for another go. <laughs> uh, forestry back into my forestry. In the summer, we are keen gardeners. Uh, and I always think it's quite nice for people to have a look at flowers when you come out of the frozen white yeah. sun. Um, roses, all stuff. And um, my family, my wife, well, I, my long suffering wife, is a very supportive wife, Daphne. Um, my elder daughter, Jane, who's 30. My son, David. My daughter, Hannah, who's training to be a neuropsychologist. And the, uh, the fellow had a terrible pair of red trousers. And the only reason I'm wearing them, I got them for 10 euro, and I thought, Jesus, this is a bargain. Uh, and then, then somebody took a photograph, and I looked at myself in them, and I've never worn them since. <laughs> and even the little terriers turned away. <laughs> and we have, lucky to have one grandson, Henry, who's three, and he's helping with the hay. Uh, we are an area which is quite damp and wet. There are a lot of bogs. We, we do no longer take turf in the bogs, but this is making mud peat, which is the loose stuff which you make into sort of a, like a porridge and make a little uh, peat, uh, lumps of peat by that if it is allowed to dry out. Uh, I'm keen uh, forestry, so this is my Ferguson, which is older than uh, Edmund Hillary's one. This is 1954, and I'm using it to split logs at home. We do have uh, a nice boat, which my father got in 1911, and we entertain. Well, I can't entertain all of you on it, but we have had people who work at Port Lockroy, Rick Atkinson, some of you know, who's written a book on dog sledging, dogs in Antarctica, and my wife looking the other way. And, of course, lovely limestone landscape, cast limestone with wonderful wildflowers, orchids, which is a plug for Ireland. Uh, I probably brought the first ever cavern flag to, to Antarctica, this is Cavan Oscaliga in Ireland. Um, penguins are on the lookout, something beginning with S, whether it's snow or Shackleton, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but I did buy this card in Ireland recently. It's not a Photoshop either. Um, of course, Shackleton's lots of plaques and memorials. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't think, I think actually they didn't put anything else in because the Arcti Antarctician is spelled wrong as well. Uh, somebody gave me this card recently. <coughs> Neither of these women is my wife. Uh, so to end, in case you've forgotten about Shackleton now, uh, you won't, I hope. Um, I greatly admire him his optimism, his patience, idealism, imagination. Above all, I think he was human. He understood what made people tick. He had empathy with other people's strengths and weaknesses, and he had strengths and weaknesses. So he was a sensitive person who adjusted himself to the situation, and he never looked back, he never was negative, he always looked forward. If things went wrong, it was his optimism that drove him forward. And I think that was great. He never wasted time on criticizing others. Well, he would have had his views on things, but, but it was always, if things go wrong, what's the best way out of this hole, and, or mess, or whatever? And uh, that was one of his greatest characteristics. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've been on a long time. But uh, then I won't say anything more. Um, I'm sure you want to go and get fresh air. Um, if you have any questions, anybody got any questions? I mean, you know the story anyway, I don't know why I'm giving a talk. <laughs>